Everyone, welcome back. Uh, this will be part two of the uh, external walk around video we started a few days ago. So the intent of this video is to kind of give you um, a more in-depth view at all the external features of the of the KW. And the way I'm going to do that is by using the operator's manual, the Dash 10 uh, Chapter 8 pre-flight checklist, which is a little bit more detailed or goes step by step. Uh, through all the things that we would look at in a walk around. So this has the potential to be quite a long vid, so strap in if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And uh, I also want to just kind of lead all this off by uh, discussing Kiowa Warrior Y. So what's the aircraft all about? Maybe some of the basic features that make it unique, uh, some of the basic characteristics, etc. And uh, so that's how I'll lead off the discussion. All right, so the first thing to note about the KW is what's it all about? So you may or may not be familiar with the aircraft itself. You've probably seen something that looks a lot like it in civilian life, which is the, the Bell 206 Jet Ranger, which obviously this helicopter has some lineage with. Um, and in the Army in the 60s, the OH-58 Alpha, which was a direct competitor to the OH-6 Alpha, uh, both existed around the same time and came into service around the same time, and uh, it's a long story. You can uh, look up elsewhere on how one supplanted the other. Lots of theories on that, but uh, suffice it to say that the OH-58 has been around in U.S. Army service for many decades now. The Kiowa left, um, the Kiowa Warrior, the D model, left Army service uh, right around 2017, I think, is when the last units were shutting down. And at that time, it had been uh, in service since the mid-80s in various forms or another. So a little, little bit of history about that. I'll start off in the late 70s when the Army was looking to replace the Vietnam-era scouts with a more advanced uh, scout to uh, take us into the 1980s, which was the, I think it was called the Armed Scout Helicopter uh, or Advanced Helicopter Program. So they started doing some studies and sort of determined what were the characteristics that um, a scout helicopter would need transitioning from sort of the Vietnam era into uh, what we used or what we would envision use for in the 1980s in the upcoming technological battlefield. That led into the AHIP program, which is the Advanced Helicopter Improvement Program that the Army ran, and ultimately that resulted in uh, the OH-58D. So that's a derivative of the Alpha Chuck that had it existed previously, but there's very actually very little in common between the two. So while they may look similar externally, they have radical differences both internally in terms of weights, size, uh, power, and obviously the, the capabilities. So whereas the Alpha Chuck or the Bell 206 is basically just a small single engine, uh, two-bladed rotor system, um, basic general utility helicopter that was also used in the scout role, with had many modifications over the years. The D model uh, was a purpose-built light observation helicopter. So out of the AHIP program, I think the original requirement came from the artillery branch, and they were looking for a platform that could provide uh, forward observation for indirect fires. And in order to do that, they need some pretty, pretty sophisticated technologies that would allow, number one, the helicopter to know where it is, and then uh, allow the crew to find targets. So that's what the MMS is all about, obviously. So in that is contained a laser range finder designator with which you can locate, designate targets, and uh, a thermal camera and a day TV camera. And the crew would use that and to hide behind cover, which is what the MMS enables. And so in those days, uh, they would range forward of friendly forces and provide observation for fires by remaining behind cover and using the MMS to unmask and then locating targets and sending that information back to the, back to the artillery guys. Um, by the way, I should mention here, um, I, 
hope to just kind of keep this overview brief and quick. But uh, if you want to know more about the inception of the of the Kiowa and some of the things I'll talk about here shortly, go check out uh, Casmos, my buddy Casmos, Low Level Hell podcast, and you can find many episodes detailing not only helicopter operations and military helicopter operations in general, but specifically some episodes uh, about the Kiowa Warrior and where it came from. So go check that out. Uh, all right, back to it. Okay, so in the late 80s, there was this operation called uh, Prime Chance, which was going on in the Persian Gulf area of the world. And by the way, back to the uh, Low Level Hell podcast, <clears throat> uh, Jeff Whittington was one of the interviewees. He was one of the uh, original members of Task Force 118 and deployed to that part of the world. So you can get the uh, entire story of uh, how Operation Prime Chance and the early days of the Kiowa Warrior there. But suffice to say, that was uh, kind of when the um, Kiowa Warrior was conceived and uh, showed up with the first weapons on it. And from there, uh, the Army adopted it as its primary uh, armed reconnaissance platform, which segues us nicely into so reconnaissance and its uh, role as in the greater scheme of things um, and what the cavalry does. So if you didn't know, reconnaissance essentially is fighting for information. So a little bit different than surveillance and observation uh, in that those you just kind of look at things without affecting them. Um, kind of like a UAV perhaps. Uh, the purpose of the cavalry and specifically the OH-58 within cavalry, and there's both air and ground cavalry, but uh, doctrinally the CAV provides uh, reconnaissance, which is providing information to the commander, potentially by fighting for that information, uh, and also security, so uh, able to conduct a counter reconnaissance fight against the enemy's own reconnaissance forces, which may be able to influence or impact our own friendly main body forces, and uh, provides uh, a free maneuvering force uh, that the commander can use to react quickly uh, to things that happen on the battlefield. So that's ultimately why the, why the KW is there. It's armed because it has to be able to fight for information and potentially fight uh, against the enemy's own reconnaissance forces, both ground and air, and we'll get to that. Um, so came into regular army formations replacing the UH-1 and AH-1 in cavalry organizations and became, um, in those days, it was fielded into both light and heavy divisions. So as a divisional cavalry squadron, you may have uh, three troops of M1 tanks and Bradleys and two troops of uh, Kiowa Warriors, and then a maintenance troop and a headquarters troop, and pretty phenomenal warfighting organization that was kind of a self-contained maneuver force. Uh, in the light divisions, there were uh, two troops of Kiowa Warriors and a Humvee tow-equipped troop, uh, also maintenance and headquarters, etc. So a lot less combat power there, but very different functions in terms of uh, how the light and heavy divisions uh, work. But that's not for this discussion. I just want to give a quick overview of how they were task organized into uh, warfighting formations. And um, then also just kind of talk quickly about the difference between uh, doctrinal reconnaissance and security and what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So most of you probably think of the Kiowa operating in Afghanistan and Iraq in the um, stability operation kind of uh, mission set, which is COIN, that is to say counterinsurgency operations, uh, which is not really uh, maneuver warfare. So operating out of fixed base, forward operating bases, etc., called FOBs or COPs or bigger bases like Kandahar and Bagram, etc. Uh, but that, uh, you know, the lines didn't change there. So there were, COIN is basically, um, if you can think of it, almost like a, like a policeman who patrols his given area of responsibility every day and then reacts to uh, crises that happen and also you know, provides security and, and reaction to when they find something happening that shouldn't be happening. So that's how the, the KW operated in, in those theaters and it did it very successfully because it's a relatively simple aircraft that had maintained a very high operational readiness rate. So there's some advantages to that, and uh, you know, 
it's also a great scout platform. We operated with the doors off, which allowed us to uh, use our Mark I eyeballs as well as the sensors. And we'll talk about the, you know, kind of the positives and, and negatives of, of the platform and, and how it was used uh, maybe in some other videos. All right, some of the basics. So obviously it's a uh, single engine, uh, two person helicopter with some unique features, one of which is the MMS. So that's what I always have to explain to people. Like when I told them what I did for a living, if they asked me friends and family, um, hey, I fly the Kiowa Warrior and I'd usually get a blank stare and I'd explain, oh, it's the one with the ball on top, the little one that looks like the police choppa. So the fundamental difference between the the Bell 206 or the Long Ranger or the uh, OH-58 Alpha Chuck is uh, kind of the, the weight. So all up, the the D model weighs about 5,200 or its maximum weight is 5,200 pounds, uh, which is limited for safety reasons um, by regulation, basically. I believe the, the max gross takeoff weight for, or let's just say a standard operating weight for uh, a 206 is somewhere in the neighborhood of I want to say 2,800 pounds, maybe 3,000 pounds. So there's quite a bit of difference there, uh, and that is basically, you know, the the Kiowa is much more powerful. It has a 650 shaft horsepower engine versus I th think it was about 327 in the Alpha Chuck. Uh, obviously, a four-blade rotor system versus a two-blade. Um, much better tail rotor. Uh, Clearly, the MMS is a distinguishing feature, and uh, and it's armed. And more importantly, on the inside, uh, it has a very sophisticated navigation system, and the uh, the electronics in the glass cockpit are uh, pretty awesome. And I believe uh, one of the claims to fame of the Kiowa Warrior is that it was uh, the first glass cockpit helicopter to be fielded and it has a, a number of other firsts for instance the WISPA system the wire stack strike protection and some other things that were firsts uh, for the Kiowa as I remember them I'll call them out all right um, that that's the basic differences so from there uh, let's talk about the pre-flight process so on day one of uh, flight line well, let me back that up. You'd show up as a trainee to flight school when you go to the AQC, and you'll probably do a couple of weeks of academic training first. Um, and then you actually go out to the flight line, and you'll spend a day or two um, just in class learning academic subjects. And then the first day that you go out uh, with your IP to meet the aircraft, so to speak. So we would walk up and take that entire day, basically, to go through the dash 10 and hopefully the students had prepared prior and were at least somewhat familiar with where to find the information but it was our job to educate them obviously. Uh, so we'd take them out to the aircraft and run through a very very detailed pre-flight process uh, that took much much longer than it would you know operationally so pre-flight typically would take 20-30 minutes uh, once you walk out to the aircraft and as you became proficient you know that the time was shortened but that first day we probably took two to three hours to go over every little detail answer questions and point out what it is exactly they should be looking at open all the doors etc so let's do that uh, so this entire video then will be uh, basically going through the dash 10 expanded checklist and I will just talk about all the different items as I did in my cockpit static videos and uh, you know, talk about as much as we can find about the aircraft. So obviously pre-flight is something you have to do before every mission of the day. Uh, and as we would approach the aircraft, the very first thing is the before exterior check. So the note there, or actually it's a warning, um, says do not pre-flight the aircraft until the weapon systems are safe. So as we approach, we notice that all the tie downs and blade socks and all that good stuff is still on there. But we just kind of take a general quick uh, visual recon of the aircraft uh, to make sure that nothing looks out of place and to note whether the aircraft is armed or not. Now I can look down the tubes here and see that there's no rockets in there, but we'd be approaching the aircraft. Basically just took a quick look. 
Okay, so we would note that the weapon systems are safe, and we do that by looking for the ejector rack uh, pins installed and any flags that we should be looking for um, visible. The Hellfire launcher safe arm switch. Okay, so here's a cutaway of the Hellfires, and uh, you got Falcon and Burundus there again. Uh, so the Hellfire uh, arm safe switch is right, we focus in on it, right there. And uh, we'd be just taking a quick look at this. So this thing actually rotates. Uh, there is a safe and an armed. So we would just make sure it's safe for pre-flight. Now, to note, um, you could leave it in safe and take off. And when you apply power to the armament control panel and then select a Hellfire system, it automatically rotates to arm. So it's not something that you have to do prior to takeoff. It'll just uh, function on its own when you select that weapon system once you're armed up. All right, then back to the uh, static model. So then we would uh, confirm that the master arm switch is off. So I'm going to approach the cockpit and basically take a look inside. All right, then I'm going to, so looking inside, I'm going to confirm that the master arm switch is in fact off and take a look at the gun switch if we do have a, a, uh, a gun on board. So, and jettison uh, cover switch is down is what we do want to note. Laser arm standby switch off so we take a look at that right there all right so that's the interior okay then we step back outside and the next warning is do not pre-flight until the CMOS systems are uh, engaged so the first thing we look is for the right side intermediate fuselage the CMOS safety pin <clears throat> which is over here I forget exactly where it is it's just a small pin you make sure you walk back there and make sure it's installed and then it's back to the cockpit where I would look at the pilot collective, make sure that the uh, CMOS jettison switch cover is down and lock wired, and also ensure that the control panel, um, I think I did that out of order, but you get the idea, uh, that the control panel is in the safe position. And lastly, on the interior, I'm going to look at my pubs. So I've got my checklists. Uh, Somewhere down here would be the mag compass. In the logbook, I got to look for the DD form 1896, which is the uh, fuel card, or otherwise known as the identiplate. The 365-4 are the weight and balance forms, which are very, very important. I have to make sure those are in compliance. We're supposed to have a dash 10 with us, and in any local forms that you might need um, for the mission, for instance. Could be procedures, could be maps, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, then it is truly back outside, and we would remove any covers, locking devices, tie downs, and grounding cables. Main rotor blades check, so I would come up to the main rotor blade, basically stand underneath it, each one, and I would rotate the head around. Uh, once these tie downs are removed, I would rotate the head around and look at each blade. I would pull down on the tip, make sure that I could flex, that it flexed properly. Um, there's an elastomeric coating on the leading edge, and this is a magnesium wear strip. But uh, there's a coating on the blade that occasionally, when the blades start to get worn uh, due to airflow, that coating would start to peel away. So uh, we would want to ensure that there's no excessive damage or peeling to the blades and you can pull down on the tips with up to 60 pounds of force so this rope right here is providing quite a bit of downforce already in this blade you can see the the way it's um, curved and there's absolutely no problem with that you can pull down on the tips of those blades with up to 60 pounds and flex them quite a bit so if you're of average height like I am uh, I would have to either reach up as tall as I could get or maybe even jump a little bit to catch the blade and uh, pull it down so that I could look across the top of it. But primarily what I'm looking for is uh, any rippling or breaking in the surface of those blades that would indicate that there's cracks developing, etc. And then I would do that for each one in succession and just rotate them around. And then prior to flight, I would set the blades just like this so that uh, they're basically at 45 degree angles to the uh, eye line from the cockpit. All right, the ignition key lock switch on. So you take that sucker out of your pocket and then 
walk over back into the cockpit, put the key into the ignition key lock, and go ahead and rotate it on at that point. That way, hopefully, you're not forgetting it uh, on the start sequence. And I'll mention that again, knock on wood. You're going to hear that again. Okay, the next warning. Weapons can be inadvertently fired while the aircraft is on the ground, the master switch is in the arm position, and electrical power is applied to the aircraft. And your MCPUs have failed, uh, or the MCPU circuit breakers are pulled. So, what does all that mean? That means if you're not careful and you do a lot of steps in exactly the wrong way, uh, you could potentially fire a weapon while you're on the ground, provided you were armed with power to the aircraft, uh, etc., etc., and all those conditions are met. And believe it or not, it's happened. For one thing, our armament guys would have to come out and occasionally do uh, weapons functions checks. And if they weren't properly supervised or if they were inexperienced or whatever the case may be, there's lots of reasons that things can go wrong. Uh, it has happened that somebody has fired the gun or fired a rocket um, from the aircraft on the ground. Obviously, it doesn't happen very often, but that's why that warning is in there. You don't get warnings in manuals unless somebody has actually done it, right? Okay, the gas generators containing pyro propellant are installed in the forward airbag modules. These things right here, these clamshells. Okay, the propellant can be ignited by electrostatic discharge and can cause severe injury or loss of life. So that means static electricity could potentially, I suppose, set those things off. I've never heard of that happening, so probably an edge case. All right, cockpit power on checks. I'll meet you back in the cockpit. Cockpit power on checks. We got to check a couple things out, like lights and uh, some of the caution warnings, etc. So the first thing we want to do is make sure the ignition circuit breaker is off, and that is right up there. Okay, we want that sucker off. We want to make sure that the fuel boost is off, which is right there, that uh, center pin. And we want to make sure the essential uh, bus switch is in start, which is that last, the first row, last switch to the rear. Then we can go ahead and turn the battery on. All right, let's do our cockpit interior checks. So lights, uh, check if use is anticipated. So let's just say we are going to uh, fly at night. So I'll go ahead and turn my lights on. And at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and turn my uh, searchlight on. All right, then we'd step outside and check to make sure that all our lights are working. So I can see that my lower anti-collision is working, my upper, my uh, green position light and let's see if I can't yep looks like our tail lights working and our search light and if I bring it around to this side I can see that my red position light is also working so it looks like all our lights are functioning properly so I'll hop back into the cockpit turn all those back off all right and then we check our MPD, check our battery voltage. Well, so since we're set to uh, fuel right here, I can verify that my I got a full bag of gas required uh, for the mission. I'm going to check my battery voltage. So we got 24 volts. Got to have at least 21 to start the aircraft. So that's a really good battery right there. Caution warning and advisory messages. Let's see, I was getting a little lost on my checklist there. All right, so uh, I can do an initial indication here. So I've got nine cautions, one advisory, AC, DC, low oil pressure, fuel boost fail, pitch roll, all, all those are pretty normal. I'll use my acknowledge switch to cycle through those. Inverter, low oil pressure, SCAS, yaw, engine anti-eyes, all are normal indications. What I'm looking for at this point is to make sure that there's no uh, FADEC maintenance message or uh, FADEC no auto start or any other limits exceeded like if the previous guy did some stuff that he wasn't supposed to it would latch and it would show here when I turn the battery back on basically once um, once I accept this aircraft all breakages are on me if I don't check something and I go fly this aircraft when I come back it says uh, transmission over torque and I know I didn't over torque it but I forgot to check it before taking off well still it's my fault because 
there's no way to say whether that message was there or not before I accepted the aircraft. All right, FedEx monitor and engine history pages. So let's see. I don't believe that um, these are, are implemented. So I'm going to go to the fiddle menu. I'll check my engine history page. Yeah, there's really no uh, no reason to access these, but these would contain some additional exceedances and stuff like that, but has absolutely zero value in game. That might be something to do after release, but it's not anything to hold up release. All right, MVG power converters, check and test if use is anticipated. So those are back here. I can't quite get to them. Yeah, they're, they're where there are some uh, boxes back here that would uh, supply power to the MVGs if I didn't want to use my battery pack on the back of my head. Nobody ever used those, but you can plug the MVGs into those. Uh, but it's another cable coming off their head that you wouldn't necessarily want. So nobody ever used those. So I would say use is not anticipated. Uh, ECSU, check the system fault indicator. So that's uh, actually in the back. Um, let me go back to the external model. Um, it's down in here, and it's a bit indicator uh, that since these doors don't open, we can't look, we can't look for those. So go back to the inside of the cockpit all right and that is it so then we go battery switch off hey so here's a little better view the uh, the battery power converters is on this panel right here so you could plug a wire in here that would run to the back of your helmet to run your your MVGs all right the next step would be uh, the PC DTSV Pemka cards installed as required so those are behind this door right here there's a slot for the four cards um, and then we move back into the interior. So, okay, back over to the uh, static model since we can't see the lap belts in the uh, in the client model. So I would check condition and security of the pilot seat lap belts, etc. So make sure there's nothing wrong here. Lateral ITS assembly and gas generators. So so this is the lateral lateral uh, ITS assembly for the cockpit airbag system. Uh, the the pilot forward airbag module is right here and the gas generator is inside of it and uh, the flight controls check and adjust so I could uh, set my preliminary frictions on my flight controls and then uh, I would set my pedals to be as far forward or aft as I wanted them to be all right so this brings us up to the exterior check and uh, I guess this is that the even though we're, what, 25, 30 minutes into this, this is going to be the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, I'm still going to use the checklist, but I'm going to go off script a little bit as well and just talk about all the different things that catch my eye. So first thing I want to mention is uh, the pre-flight kind of has uh, a method to it. So you kind of, like we just did, we start on the walking up to the aircraft, making sure that it's safe to approach, etc. And then you knock out some of the interior cockpit checks. Uh, but then the true meat and potatoes of the of the pre-flight is starting essentially at the nose and you work your, your way around the right side of the aircraft out to the tail and then come back around the other side. If you're by yourself, you just do the whole pre-flight. A lot of times we would walk out there with both crew members and each crew member would take a portion of the checklist. So, for instance, the right seater would have the nose uh, and he would go back to the tail. And then conversely, the, the left seater would start at the tail, at the uh, tail rotor gearbox and work their way forward so that they ended up or so that he ended up um, at the nose, essentially. So that was a way to split up the crew duties to make the pre-flight go a little bit quicker. And then you could go back, uh, you both go back for the, uh, the mission brief or go get a snack or whatever. Um, so that was just a kind of a quick way to do it. So let's, let's start with the, the walk around, right? Okay, the crew door, check condition, emergency release mechanism and hinges. So what I would do there, what we would do is uh, just take a look at the, so there's an operating rod in here. Uh, that is the quick release mechanism. So the doors uh, opened from back to back to front, basically. So the hinge is up here. And uh, let's see if I can't zoom in a little bit better. 
Okay, so this is the uh, door pop handle basically. So there's some pins that extend through here. They're not quite modeled here yet. So you would see uh, two pins. Um, well, you don't, sorry, they're on the inside. Uh, and the, the hinges actually go through a hole in here and then there's a cotter pin. There's a rod that is operated by, not a cotter pin, but a rod that is operated by this handle. And when you pull this handle, it, it pops uh, the two pins top and bottom and the door just flops off. So you want to make sure, especially if the door is installed, that that operating rod and only had about a quarter inch of, uh, of spacing on it, well half an inch I should say by the book, um, and you want to make sure that at least that much protrudes below it. So, All right, then we go to the static port. Well, let me back up a little bit before we do that. Let's talk about the front of the helicopter. So just want to point out some, some features um, that are not specifically covered in the checklist, so to speak. So let's look at the front. These are the vents. So the vent knob, the vent pull knobs inside the cockpit, all these are is are air ducts that lead to the interior. So when you pull those those knobs, the louver opens up in here and uh, you get fresh air into the cockpit. Not that big of a deal when you're flying doors off, obviously, but uh, pretty nice to have if you do if you are forced to be doors on. All right, ASC equipment. So here we have the CMOS, um, which is part of the checklist, the right forward EOMs. So that would be this one right here. So we check condition and security there. Um, what is not shown here is the spiral antenna for the APR39. So on the client model that is there, on this static model, it's not. I don't know whether that's going to be selectable or not. That's beyond my ken. Uh, the chin bubbles, obviously, we already talked about in the previous video um, how the how the pedals work. These are This is the control rod that uh, connects both together and there's a bell crank in here and then some more push-pull tubes that go through the bulkhead at the bottom. Okay, this is the pitot tube which uh, is tied in with the air data system also through the static uh, port right here. So this provides dynamic or ram air pressure to the air data system and the uh, static port just provides ambient air pressure and there's one on each side basically so you see one right there and one here on this side so that's number two all right there's also an e ohms on the bottom which I can't quite get to uh, which provides uh, protection from the bottom of the helicopter we talked about the the spiral antennas uh, let's see in here these are little uh, vent tubes that uh, go up to the battery so the battery is underneath this cover right here in the old days, it was a nickel cadmium battery. I think it weighed around 60 or 65 pounds. Um, in the late teens, or late aughts, I should say, early teens, they replaced those nickel cadmium old style batteries with lithium ion batteries that were, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 percent of the weight. And that's significant because uh, it affected the CG of the aircraft. So when you think about helicopters, the center of gravity is typically underneath the mass, right? So you look at all these components um, that affect how the helicopter hangs, so to speak. So if you take away a heavy weight that's uh, far out on this arm, pretty much as far on the helicopter as you can get in terms of the moment that that heavy weight um, causes to the center of gravity of this aircraft, you have to make up for that, otherwise the CG changes. This aircraft was already significantly back heavy. In other words, it hung nose high. So the last piece that it hung left skid low uh, and the, the last portion of it that left the ground was this left heel of this skid. So it would pick up right toe first and then keep coming up and it actually hung a little bit left side low. They had to actually install ballast in there to make up for the change in CG shift be due to that lighter battery. Okay, let's go to the next page. All right, we got caution, absence of a lateral rocking motion. Uh, and that is a design feature. So there's a one single pivot point on the bottom of this uh, aft cross tube. So on the front, there's two mount points and on the back, it's actually a shoe. And that is mounted on a single pivot point that is attached to the bottom of the helicopter. And when you walk up to the side of this thing and you, you push on it, 
um, you can actually cause this to to rock back and forth quite significantly and that's desirable because what it does is it helps reduce harmonic vibrations so by having that as a pivot point it's it's essentially acting as a dampener so you would want to make sure that that uh, rocking motion is there and that this either hasn't collapsed and that it is allowed to basically tilt back and forth on this single pivot point back here so it's essentially it's a flexible mount for those skids and that's what you want otherwise you get into something called um, uh, harmonics on the ground and that can be quickly disrupt disruptive um, if they if they hit the right frequency basically it'll just the helicopter will just tear itself apart and that that flexibility is designed to pr uh, reduce or prevent that I haven't talked about the antennas here so this is the lower L2 mom antenna and uh, right here is the upper L2 mom antenna so one is transmit one's receive I forget which one's which I'm guessing that transmits coming out the bottom and receive is coming out the top if I were to guess but I don't remember I could be wrong if I'm wrong uh, I'm sure somebody will let me know and uh, just reverse it you only have two options the cross tubes, all right, so we're at number five, landing gear, cross tube, skid shoes, weight on gear switch, etc. So I'd crawl underneath and check the weight on gear switch, which would be underneath here, and that's just basically a rocker switch that compresses when weight goes on the, on the landing gear. Uh, we want to make sure there's no cracks or anything in the cross tubes, that the skid shoes are, are firmly in, in place, and that there's no obvious damage. Right here, these little lugs uh, are for the ground handling wheels. So there's a, a set of removable um, dolly wheels, basically, that just attach here with a pin, and then they have a hydraulic jack on it. Once you put the pins in with the wheels, they would straddle over this. You just crank on that jack, and then there's a fulcrum that, that raises each skid up so that you can, it basically just rises up on those wheels. And then with about four or five guys, you can just push the helicopter around uh, for ground handling. The, uh, the tow hooks here, this is where uh, just like you would see a big uh, airliner being towed at the airport, we would attach a tow bar that would, you know, come out to the front here, basically in a triangle. So you'd attach a tow bar that would come out to the front, and that could be towed by uh, a small vehicle, uh, a ground handling vehicle. All right, the weapon systems, let's talk about those. So let's see if I can't zoom in here. And we'll come around to this rocket pod here. So obviously this is a gun rocket aircraft. Uh, weapon systems check. That's an expanded task, so there's a lot of stuff going on there. We're going to check that the cables are secure, the pins we've already looked at. Okay, I want to make sure that my cables are securely attached to the aircraft. There's also, you can't quite see it here, but underneath here there would be the uh, the pusher piston from the ejector rack. So the explosive cartridges that are contained within the ejector rack, there's actually a piston that pushes against this tube. You want that in contact with the metal because if it's not, if there's a gap between the piston and whatever it's pushing against, when it fires, it's basically just going to punch through it without kicking off that uh, rocket tube or the Hellfire rack or whatever. So part of the pre-flight check was to just make sure that it is securely in contact with the top of the uh, the top of the metal tube, basically, so that it can just push away efficiently. Uh, that's basically it for the weapons. Obviously, we want to make sure. Uh, one more thing I forgot here. Uh, these actually, there's a pin behind here, a big one that's called an expandable bolt or expandable pin so you can rotate a handle out of the way it would flip around and then that would unlock these and then you can just flip this up for basically rolling this aircraft uh, onto a C-17 or C-130. When you need to squat it you can rotate these things up so that they're stowed sort of kind of like on an aircraft carrier the wings of an aircraft of an aircraft you can just rotate these up and, and get them up higher off the ground so you can drop the aircraft on the quick deployment gear avionics compartment this is where all the black boxes were 
Uh, so we would open this door up, check to make sure the MF MMS processors and everything was secure in there. We'd also stow a little bit of baggage and whatnot in there. Now I should note that it gets pretty hot back there because of all the electronics. That, that compartment was chock full of uh, black boxes. So number one, there's not a whole lot of room. Um, if I was to, to look at this right here, the fuel cell is right here as I trace this out. So the fuel cell goes like this. All right, and then it follows this contour line right here. Okay, so there's an L-shaped, basically what this door does. In the Alpha Chuck, you had seats back here. Well, that's all that space is now taken up by black boxes. Uh, runs the armament electrical controller, the AEU, armament electrical unit, uh, the MMS processor and the MMS power supply. Then you get the VHF, UHF. So those are distributed between the uh, left and right side, uh, but the bottom line is there's pretty much every little bit of space back here is filled up. Uh, this right here is the forward right L2 MUM, sorry, the AVR2 uh, receiver, which hooks into the ASE, Alpha Electrical Avionics and Components. The inertia reel, I'd want to check that the inertia reel is functioning, so I'd give my, my belt a swift tug to make sure that the um, quick lock mechanism is actually functioning. First kit, first aid kit I would look at, that's back here behind the pilot's head. There it is. Right there, that's the first aid kit. That would have a tag on it that would uh, basically in the, indicate the date that it was inspected, which is uh, important. It has to be within uh, service life and properly inspected, basically. All right, moving on to the, uh, the rest of the components. Um, after we've checked the avionics compartment, we're looking at the right aft eOMs. So I move back here. That's the right aft eOMs. The right AVR2 sensor, the aft one, I should say. And then right here would be the uh, right side aft APR39 pulse warning spiral antenna right here forgot to mention, let's go back and talk about these real quick. Uh, so back on the front, these little bug eyes are the uh, MVG positional lights, right? They're only visible under goggles. And I also didn't talk about the searchlight. So this is actually a uh, two-sided searchlight. So this would rotate down and forward. So what we saw on power on checks was the visible side. And then with your thumb force, with a thumb force controller, um, a servo would drop this light on a, on a forward-facing pivot right here, and then you could orient it left or right and slew it around like a searchlight. And if you slewed it around long enough, it would face the other side of it forward, and that is the uh, IR light that's basically only visible under NVGs. Okay, going back to the right EOMs. We looked at those, the ASE equipment. What's next? Okay, we got number six, fuel check, cap secure. That's right here. Typically, we would open that up, um, pull that cover off, and just kind of look with a flashlight in there to make sure that fuel is actually visible, and then just close it right back up and, and check the, and close that cap. All right, number seven, hydraulic servos and flight controls. So, Behind this door right here, we just pop this. This is only one little cam lock. You'd open this up and you look in there. So you're checking the uh, hydraulic filter, which has a, an LRB, a little red button. If it was popped, you, you don't want it popped. The SCAS actuator, so you have one, two, three up here on the hydraulic service deck. So you have uh, pitch roll and collective uh, servo actuators and the, the SCAS actuator. So you just want to uh, basically check condition and security and the IFF and UHF antenna connectors. So this is the upper UHF antenna. The lower one is right here. All right, these blade antennas. And behind this pillow is the uh, upper IFF antenna. The rear one is back here. This is the rear and lower IFF antenna, that, that's what the uh, transponder sends out its signals on. And basically the connections for these antennas are coming off the 
uh, out of the fuselage and then there's some connectors that are attached to this upper cowling so if you ever want to take this cowling off you you better make sure that you take or disconnect those connections and it happens quite often the the maintainers would forget to remove those those little antenna connections and you know this this thing weighs i don't know 40 50 pounds probably if not more so when they're trying to get that thing off with all these cam locks right here they just undo all these and then it just snaps right off and you're struggling to get this off the deck and that that wire still connected you can imagine that they ripped up a lot of uh connectors on those uh antenna fittings and that caused a lot of problems because sometimes you don't know that you wrecked it until you try to use it and then it's not transmitting properly all right uh and the big thing is we're make one big note to look for is on the hydraulic service deck is just to look for the presence of like puddles of fluid anywhere right you don't want that moving to number eight then the transmission cowling which i've talked about by the way this shroud right here is a late edition late i don't you know it was uh 2000s basically this entire assembly so you can kind of see the outline of what it covers if you look at photos of some 58s you will see that this upper entire forward and aft uh, cowling is not present those were added because of rocket firing um, especially at a hover if you were doing ripple fire you would generate a lot of smoke and that that rocket exhaust had the potential to get sucked right into the engine inlet so the engine inlet is actually right behind here on either side so it, there's right here and on the other side and so what they did was they basically enclosed it and made a, a tunnel a channel and then now where the air is coming in from is this forward engine inlet right here and so it's sucking air from the front so that got rid of uh, that smoke ingestion which if you had enough of it ingested uh, it would actually cause the engine to choke because uh, there wasn't enough oxygen so you had the potential for like compressor stalls etc all right, so we're checking the transmission cowling for damage and security, and then the inlet blast shield if installed for condition and its obstructions. So the inlet uh, blast shield is the forward, and then you also have the aft, and there's just a tiny little, let me see if I can't rotate around on it. Yeah, it is there. So you undo these little cam locks, and this little portion would come off. So that would provide you both air coming in from the front and the back. Okay, engine barrier filter system. You look through this little window right here and you look at the filter. So there's a K&N filter behind there. It's an oiled cotton filter that is on a uh, supporting structure of wire mesh. And uh, basically all it does is it filters out junk from getting in the engine. In the old days, prior to the cotton filters, we had something called the EBF, uh, correction, the uh, particle separator, which was actually hundreds and hundreds of little swirl tubes um, that removed debris centrifugally so the the swirl tube was about if you imagine the size of your finger with uh, a corkscrew in it and when you run air down that corkscrew it separates out the dust as it goes from the front to the back and that thing um, that's what why you pull that uh, particle separator circuit breaker uh, during the start sequence because there there's a bypass motor that had, there's a door on the interior of the engine deck here just below the transmission and if those filters become clogged that uh, will create a pressure differential and when that trips a switch basically that actuator that servo motor just opens up a door that just allows raw and filtered air to come in from the bottom of the transmission deck which is usually filled with a lot of gunk and junk and so you're looking to make sure that number one there's no just obvious debris on the filter before you even take off and second that motor if if you can open this door right here and you can see the motor and to make sure that it doesn't appear to be obviously damaged all right that brings us to nine transmission check lines cables and connections for condition and leaks all right so that's this door right here i would just open this up hold it with my hand and i'd look i can see the service level or the oil level of the transmission through a sight glass so i'd be looking at the transmission right here so i'd look to make sure that the oil is within limits uh, that the ebf bypass door that i was just talking about is actually closed and ensure the bypass door area is clear of snow ice etc and debris and then I just close that door 
Hey guys, we're just approaching about 50 minutes, so I thought I'd end it there. We'll pick up with part three and conclude the rest of the walk around and the pre-flight checks. In the meantime, enjoy this little video of a I-model Kiowa warrior assigned to 1-4 Cavalry out of Schweinfurt, Germany. This is 2004 at Fob McKenzie in Iraq. And just making that turn to the FARP, the guys are coming out to meet the aircraft. He's going to make the pedal turn and then approach the FARP. This is an I-model, so just a little bit different than the version you're getting in DCS in terms of interior electronics. You can see it's got the XM296 gun on it. And as he makes that nice smooth landing to the FARP pad and pulls out his checklist and they get ready for the uh, refuel rearm checklist. All right. And here we are in 2009, and this is Kandahar, so if I remember right, this was uh, a three-ship, and they're on the uh, ramp at what we called Mustang Ramp, which is, now this is 117 Cavalry out of Fort Bragg, and you got the aircraft lining up, getting ready to take off for a mission, so you'll see them lining up here. Not a whole lot to say. I don't remember why it was uh, a three-ship. must have been... Um, maybe a specific mission where they were going out to accomplish a certain task. It probably wasn't just a patrol, but at any rate, enjoy the footage of these guys just hovering and setting down. Right after this, I'll show you what it looks like from the cockpit. What he's doing is setting down in the uh, herringbone right there. I believe number three there to the left, he's just going to hang out and wait until they take off. All right, here's the perspective from the cockpit. I don't believe this is the exact same set of three because this helicopter's facing the other way. Normally, in that herringbone, he would have been facing with the pilot door or the right side to the formation. In this case, he just chose to do it the other way. No big deal. Um, basically, when everybody's ready to take off, lead will just pick up and do that pedal turn, face the direction of takeoff, and then you know, execute the takeoff. So departing for the mission area here, uh, turning off to the north out of Mustang Ramp in Kandahar. And with that, we'll wrap this up. So check back for part three. We'll finish up from uh, right side engine and on to the left side, and we'll talk to you then. See ya.